This is Nicole Colleen, the host of Haunted Mid-Atlantic Tales, and this is episode 10. Happy Black History Month, baby! Your resident Afrogoth here to tell you that it's okay. You can reach out to your ancestors at any time. They're there. They may not be seen, but they're heard. I certainly feel my family members and their love, and you might not have the best relationship with yours, but there's residual energy that is to say, that is surrounding us. From the indigenous tribes that live here, the Piscataway, the PD that are in North Carolina, the Algonquin that live up and down Virginia, the whispers of spirits on Aranaco Street, me ghost hunting in the Midwest with my cousin Janine, Manassas Battlefield, where specters seem to surround you no matter where you turn. Consider that the supernatural isn't necessarily foreign to our lives. It's simply inexplicable, not always intangible, and not always something that you have to go far to find. Without further ado, The Ghost of Virginia. Chapter 21, Folios of Valley Folklore. Tombstone Ticklers. After the demise of a well-known fabricator of the truth, a memorial was erected over his grave, which inscribed his name, date of birth and death, and the word truth. Now several local townspeople, unable to accept such an inscription, scratched the following remark under the word truth. <laughs> it must still be in him because it never came out when he was alive. Shade! Smith found another tombstone which read, Death slipped up as sly as a weasel, and down the hill it dragged old Kiesel. <laughs> That's actually a good one. Straight from the Shenandoah Valley. Chapter 54 Ghost on Ghost Tours Collegiate Cutups Each year, on January 24th, historic Center Hill Mansion in Petersburg is open to the public for a ghost tour and it annually sells out. The main reason for this is that in 1930, Marguerite Dupont Lee and her book, Virginia Ghost, wrote about an interesting manifestation that past residents of the house said occurred annually for a number of years. They said that on a specific date, at around 7.30 in the evening, the front door would blast open and an invisible group of soldiers with their sabers clanging would march upstairs to either one of the rooms and shut the door. About half an hour later, the door would be heard to open. The military men then trampled down the stairs and exited the front door. At the 2006 tour event, this didn't happen, however, and nor has it been reenacted for a number of years. However, witnesses in a room on the third floor did report seeing and hearing the crystal prisms hanging from a lamp slowly start to sway for no apparent reason. They said that the prisms then swayed fast enough for the clinking sound to be heard and seen by all in the room for a time. So the ghosts are still there. Chapter 79, Southside Virginia Vignettes. The Creaking Bureau. Author's note, the following incident took place in Mayock, just south of Chesapeake, and was related in 1915 by a preacher named C.R. Bagley. It was subsequently recorded in a North Carolina folklore volume. So I went to the old house once to see the man and his wife. Just before retiring, the lady of the house came up to me and said, you need not worry if you hear the old burrow creaking upstairs at night. And don't pay any attention to the steps on the stairs. So I went to bed rather late after we had held family prayers, but had scarcely fallen asleep when I was suddenly awakened by such popping and snapping of that old bureau as I'd never heard before. Anxious to settle my mind the cause of this uncanny noise, I rose hurriedly, lit my candle, and peered everywhere. But there is nothing to be seen. I tried to sleep, but without success. There is nothing, and the same noise happened at regular intervals for the rest of the night. At times, steps could be heard on the stairs. Steps of a man carrying a heavy burden. At breakfast the next morning, I told my experience but could get no satisfactory explanation for the unusual noises. The lady then simply said that it was an occurrence which happened every night of her life. 
This was told by the preacher in response to a young preacher's statement that his people were so superstitious that it was necessary for him to preach a sermon against spirits. After relating this experience, which he himself had had, he turned to the young preacher and said, do you mean to tell me that you preached your people against spirits? Chapter 80, A Treasury of African-American Ghost Lore. The Mysterious Door. Culpeper County. My mother passed and I didn't like to stay with strangers and I went to this lady's house to work. And while I was getting supper one night, this noise, something hard fell down the stairs and jarred the house so that Mrs. J and her mother, her sister-in-law and a fellow by the name of Ed and myself, all armed, went upstairs thinking that there were valuable things in the house that someone had broken in, but there wasn't a thing could be seen or on the floor anywhere. Lots of times when I used to go up to make this young man's bed, I had to pass the room that they called the red room. Everything in there was red. Every time I got against this door, the door would open, but I didn't see no one come out. And many times I used to see soldiers marching across the garden. And that house was supposed to be haunted. They used it for a hospital at the time of the Civil War. That's about five miles from Brandy Station. Such tales may not send chills up Glenn's spine, a sense of identification with the sailors of both constellations has had a similar effect. The Zodiac, they're more trying to make their presence known. Something happened, maybe he was only happy at the Zodiac, or maybe it was his speakeasy. He's mad that I'm, I'm running that restaurant there, and <laughs> he's, not, he's not getting a cut of the profit. The Philip House changed hands a number of times, even once serving as a rat poison factory. By 1895, it was abandoned by its owner and left to ruin. In 1937, the work was done, the house was open to the public, and reports of unexplainable occurrences haven't stopped since. Maryland, Baltimore, the Jones House. One of the most important cases of modern poltergeist phenomena took place here between January 14th and February 8th, 1960. Edgar Jones was a retired fireman who lived in the house with his wife and their daughter and son-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Theodore Pauls. The Pauls had a 17-year-old son, Ted, who was very intelligent, but dropped out of high school to edit his own science fiction newsletter. The unexplained activity began when 15 miniature pots on a dining room shelf suddenly exploded. That was followed by three weeks of moving objects, falling pictures, broken windows, leaping plants, and bursting soda bottles. A small table moved from the living room and threw itself down a flight of stairs. And a pile of logs exploded. Things got so bad that the family moved all breakable objects into a pile in the backyard just so they can get some sleep. Nander Fodder investigated the case and concluded that it was caused by the unconscious mental abilities of the teenage boy, Ted. After the boy received counseling, the poltergeist departed. The case is known in paranormal literature as the Baltimore Poltergeist, and the Jones House is now a private residence in Baltimore, Maryland. Easton, Gross's Coat, the ghost of Aunt Molly Tilgman, who lived in this house at the turn of the century, has been observed late at night, floating down the stairway to unlock the front door. It is a ritual she performed almost nightly when she lived in the house with her young nephew. The rebellious youth often stayed out late, <laughs> but was never given his own key. So stubborn Aunt Molly still manifests late at night. And the English-style country home was in the Tilgman family. New Jersey, Morristown, the Water's Edge Cafe. Several ghost lodged at this turn of the century inn, but they did not make themselves known until the 1960s, when an Englishman bought the building. The most frequent visitor is the dark figure of a heavyset man that appears on a lounge or on a staircase. The presence once spoke to the proprietor and told him that his name was Armand Hirsute, but no one has been able to find a record of such a person's existence at the cafe. The cafe is at Lake Swannanoa in Jefferson Township, Morris County, New York. Hudson, the Beats House. This house, built in the 1830s, was haunted by Mabel Parker, a woman who moved into the house in 1904 and lived there for more than 50 years. Wow. Now during the time that the J. Dietz family lived there, 
Mabel's ghost was often heard walking up the stairs into the hall and entering a second floor bedroom where she was apt to pull the covers off of anyone sleeping in her old chamber. Hudson is in Columbia County, 30 miles south of Albany on I-87, New York City, Times Square. The ghosts of two Royal Air Force officers have been sighted walking on the sidewalks here for years. These two are always looking at their watches and seem like flesh and blood people until the stroke of midnight where they disappear into thin air. One witness said that the apparitions told them that they were killed in Berlin, World War II, and had always wanted to see Times Square. Times Square is on Broadway, 45th Street, Manhattan. Yeah, right near the theater district. I bet you there's quite a few spirits who haven't left there. Virginian Urban Legends. Bird Theater does not have a swimming pool. Richmond. There are stories online about the restrooms of the Bird Theater in Carytown, saying that they're haunted like other areas in the place. The truth is that the ghost Robert Colter doesn't haunt them. That is just one of the many myths about the theater. As he told me when interviewed about the haunting there for my book, Haunted Richmond, Virginia, the current manager, Todd Scalves, believes that people have gotten the haunted restrooms tale confused with the one from another theater in Richmond, Landmark. It happens all the time, and not just with the haunted restrooms either. People come to the theater and ask about the swimming pool, mistaking the underground spring beneath Bird for one. Of course, there's a theater in Richmond that does have a swimming pool, but it's not the Bird. That too is the landmark, whose swimming pool measures 20 by 70 feet. Chapter 22, Werewolves on the Prowl in Virginia. The Werewolf of Cumberland Gap. Some years after the Civil War ended, a legend arose of a werewolf prowling in the mountain forest of the Appalachian Mountains in the southwestern tip of Virginia. Accused of taking sheep and other farm animals, it was even blamed for the mysterious disappearances of several young women. This beast so frightened the locals that they refused to venture outdoors when the full moon arose in the night sky. A hunter was out when he saw it. Thinking it was an escaped circus animal or mountain lion, he tried to track it, but it eluded him. Months later, he slept on a rocky ledge and found the creature staring at him. It was the biggest and strangest wolf he'd ever seen. He fired his rifle at it, but the creature got away into some brush. He returned a week later with some bloodhounds to track it when his courage returned. I didn't find any tracks. Just a small amount of dried blood. He took a sample to be analyzed. He got his answer back. It was human. Whether wolf or human, the beast was never seen again, and the blood was never duplicated. This has been a thrilling edition of Haunted Mid-Atlantic Tales with you. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did, and please tune in for more. I'll be seeing you on the flip side. Take care of yourself, and again, appreciate African-American history. Appreciate the African diaspora.